Oh, I'm thankful today to Jesus for what I do feel, and not only is a feeling, but what I do know. And, uh, I'm thankful for that, glad for that Adidosia, being with A.D. Adidosia, being here, uh, annual visit with us, we appreciate it being here with us today and everyone's here. Uh, see Diane with us today. Amen. Yeah, man. Amen. For everyone that's made their way out here of the day about the hospital. Good. We're glad for him being here with us today as well. And uh, uh, we are grateful for uh, the songs that's been sung. And uh, I won't stand long here because uh, we don't give the lad and those enough time to do what the Lord would have him to do, deliver what he has for us here. But uh, that song was referencing that first song about raising your hands to, to the Lord. Yeah. And uh, this morning, I, I'm, I'm stuck on still the ideal of the interaction with God. Yeah. And uh, this is to me something that's uh, in my spirit and uh, this uh, ideal that we can approach God when we want to is such a fallacy because no man can come to God unless he draws. The Bible says that in John 6, 44. And the uh, more I look at it, the, the deeper it gets to me because uh, uh, this is a God thing. This ain't your thing. It's God thing. Amen. And uh, because of this here, I was just this song, but I wasn't necessarily, I didn't think I was going to make any mention of this, but this song. See, no man can come to God except he, the Father which has sent him, draw him. And of course, that word we know means to do what? Drag. Nobody can come to the Father, but unless Jesus draw Amen. The word was dragged. You didn't come to God. You didn't want to come to God. You didn't have no ideal about coming to God. God used whatever the method or means it was to get you here. Amen. See, and, 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 and even for that alone, he deserved praise. Yes. Yes. See, this is what he's going to have to get out of the people. And he's not getting it to the degree that he's got to get it. Because we still think we got so much involved in it as if he need us and he don't need us. We need him. Amen. That's why people do what they do to you know, work the way they work and do what they do because they feel like God needs them. God don't need none of us. Amen. In him we live, we move, and have our being. That's right. We need God. Yes, that's right. And more I, this, like Sister Joe's talking about the word great, you know, the more you see that she was trying to explain that what great was, and she found out what great was, understand a little bit more about great through the suffering. Yeah. We don't know what really the name of the Lord is until he shows us his name. <clears throat> and uh, we use that scripture there where he says his name was a secret. See, Albert is just a name. But once Albert revealed himself to you, it's, and I'm really I'm a secret to you if you don't know me. So I walk into the room, my name is Bill. I said, How you doing, Bill? That's all I know about Bill is his name. And, and I don't know whether you tell the truth about that or not, but <laughs> that's what he said his name was, Bill. But the longer I stay around Bill, and interact with Bill, I get to know Bill. You see. And I begin to understand deeper things about Bill. Bill begin to reveal himself, and that's kind of like Christ. As long as you stay around him, he keeps revealing himself to you. But first, he has to show himself to you. First, he has to deal with you. And, uh, uh, and so then people say, well, you know, uh, because that's what eliminates works. 
eliminate work coming to God. You know, if people feel like I came to God and so God owed me something. You didn't know how to get to God. God approached you. God drew you. Now, since he drew you, see, he's looking for some interaction from you. Because he made an approach to you. Praise God. You see, he was looking for the proper response. This scripture here uh, uh, in uh, Matthews, where uh, the 20th chapter of Matthews, uh, he says, uh, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborer for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And out to work, found folk idle. That's what you were, that's where you were, that's where I was, idle. Didn't have nothing, didn't have no interaction at all. And then he says, uh, and he said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right I'll give you. And they went their way. He told them, go into the vineyard, what's right I'll pay you. So there had to be first an approach there. And for you could go in, you can go out to uh, where you work at. Revere if you want to, just like if those folks don't make an approach to you, you you ain't going up in there and just start picking up a torch or wherever you work at and just start working. Somebody has to make an approach to you to draw you to accept you to come to them. And uh, even if you put your application in, let me put it like this. That application don't mean nothing if they don't ever call you. That's why people today just working, they doing stuff for God, and God ain't told them to do nothing. And they just working. And they looking for something at the end of the day, but they ain't got nothing coming if God don't been done something in between that time. That's why I preach at church if you want to go to church, go to school and preach. He just wasting his time. If God don't call you, you ain't even got to send him. You don't even have nothing to go to school for. Now listen to what I just said. Because the first thing is a call. Then he went on here and he's saying the same thing, but it, it, he, he makes this point of what I want to make a little bit clearer. He says, and again, the fifth verse, he went out about the sixth hour, sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? I was standing on corners, Fifth Avenue, in this juke joint, in this place of ill repute. I was all over doing all kind of evil stuff. I was idle. Wasn't any fruit bearing. I wasn't producing anything that worth anything, talking about anything. And they said unto him, because no man has hired us. This is the point. The same thing as really before, because nobody hired. See, if God don't make an approach to you, you can't do nothing for God. That's going to receive any reward. Now, this parable, I'm just using this because it goes on. Somebody got mad because it was hired early and somebody come in later and got the job, which is going to be down here the same way. <laughs> Let the truth be told. So we're gonna be around here all this time, and then somebody will come right in and start working. You gonna get upset thinking you supposed to got so much more, but the man worked for the same penny, got the same reward. You know what he hired you for is what you get paid for. Praise God. So whatever your seniority is, there's no such thing as that. There's no such thing as that. Go into the vineyard and work, and what's right, I'll pay you. See, I don't have what my position is here is what God has given me, but it's no seniority. 
It's my position. And so I work where he put me at to do what he has called me to do. Amen. Praise God. And be faithful in that. Amen. Amen. Be faithful in that because Amen. he called me to that. Right. And so uh, whatsoever right he paid. And so there now because he called me. That's, let me don't miss my point. Since he called me, now it's time for me to work. Yeah. This is what I'm going to make the point. Since he called me. It's for me to work. I couldn't work before he called me. See, God called me to work. But I'm not working for my salvation. I'm working because I have salvation. That lets you know something has happened. Jesus said this in John 5 and... Uh, 17, uh, he makes statements prior to this. A man taking up his bed and walking. They got upset, persecuted him. But the point I want to make, I'm just trying to stay right there, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto. Now I work. My father's been working up to so now, we're, see, God has been working. He's working in you to, to will and to. The reason you're doing whatever you're doing is because he don't work. He don't work something there. So then since he's worked it in, I need to work it out. Praise God. I'm thankful today. I, and I, and I, everything that I'm doing, I'm constantly telling God, I'm thankful that you have put that in me. Amen. Not that I had it in me because I did not have it in me. It's because he put that in me. He put faithfulness in me. He put a desire to want to do in me. He put not want to turn around in me. That's right. That's right. So then, because he worked it, I work back. Hallelujah. I appreciate yeah. this interaction Hallelujah. that we have. I do I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hallelujah. It's so, and I don't want to let something just slide in because something can slide in there. They yeah. interfere with that relationship. True. And you think you still got something going on, you ain't got it going on. Uh -huh. Look here. Uh, uh, 11 chapter Hebrews, and I think I'm going to stop right here. <clears throat> See, all of this is response to what he's did and doing. And when you I, raising my hand to this song, I said, the raising my hand, uh, overwhelmed with gratitude for the things, for the chance you given me to live a life of the chance you gave me because I didn't have it if you didn't give it to me. The chance you given me to live a life of praise to you. I'm so grateful, thankful, what else? For the, For the faithfulness you've shown to me. Hallelujah. So since he showed faithfulness to me, what is my response? Come on, Show it to him. See, it's just a, it's an action. You know, I've been talking about this while, it's just, it's just eating me up. Reciprocating. See, God just, he ain't going to drag you nowhere. He's a dragon here. Now he wants some action. And once you show that, he gives some more. And, and the action keeps working. Amen. Raising my hand. And for your loving care. Yes. And that you always there. Oh, yeah. Here go my reaction again. Hallelujah. I raise my hand to you. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop. 
I know I went to Hebrew, but I just need to stop because it's, it's, it's eating me up. Yes. Yes. He's in, in reality. Appreciative. What I'm going to show in Hebrew was these, all these three things. It's like Noah and uh, uh, verse 5. By faith, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had a testimony that he, he pleased God. Enoch had a testimony that he pleased God, but God uh, moved upon Enoch. Enoch couldn't offer this without God. Okay. If without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that So this scripture makes it sound like you make an approach to him, but it's by faith, and the Bible said that God has dealt to every man. God had to deal it to you before you started to make the move. He gotta deal you that card to play. That's right. He gotta deal you faith. He dealt to every man. Romans uh, uh, 12. He dealt to every man a measure of faith. That's 12. 12, 4, somewhere. Let's see. Romans 12, 4. He dealt to every man. 12, 3. See? I don't think more highly, let's let, look, look, verse 3. This is important. Verse 3, for I say unto you, the grace given unto me, Paul, always, that's what he recognized, that the help that he, was, that he had, it was because of him. The grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Yeah. God dealt that to us. Now while a preacher get big headed, he he just getting ready to be small headed because God's gonna put a pin in it. Or anybody else. I just use a preacher. Well he could just recognize the fact that it was this this is a God working thing. That's right. God dealt that night up. Faith to me to move. God, whatever your time was, God dealt that to you and caused that response from me. I got that He dealt something to me to cause that response from me. So sick of human beings thinking they had so much that's going on and they ain't giving God what He's supposed to have. But since He has, Dealt that. We want some responding from it. We want some responding from it. Praise God. Putting everything else in front of him instead of him being put in front of everything else. Verse 7. Noah was one of God. A thing not seen as yet. Noah was one of God. Of things that was not seen yet. What did Noah do then? Move with fear. See, he, 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 he moved with fear because God moved on him, showed him something. He responded to God and done something about what God showed him. And got off to save his house, him and his house, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness. Amen. Uh, heir, uh, 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 heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Praise God. So this this is this is an interaction thing. So uh, that's why from time to time God has to do things to draw an action. Because we wouldn't respond normally. When we begin to respond normally is because we have understood certain things. If you're up reading you're up praying. You're up worshiping. 
when you hit the floor, you're doing something towards God, that means you understand something. That you understand that there's a proper at a res uh, proper response to what has already been done. Amen. The measures of what God has done, and so you offering that back to him. Praise God. Service today. This is part of what we do. This is something God has set up for our salvation to continue our, our walk with him. Praise God. We can come in and just get uh, in, uh, a, 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 a a flow because the body needs connection. Amen. I got something this morning for myself. All right. I come here to get something from somebody, some part of me. Praise God. This is part of God's setup. And He respond. My response to God is to be faithful to the thing when I can be faithful to what God called me to. Praise God. If I'm not working, if I'm not doing other things, you know, then God looking for me to be responding to him. He's looking for that. See, and it's only a righteous thing. It's only a righteous thing for me to respond properly to, to the Lord. So anyway, we'll get back. We're getting happy, glad to have Brother Adam Doja here. And uh, we, we always appreciate it. Him and uh, I'm just overwhelmed with this idea that God. See, I know you wasn't bad. I know what you said. See, the reason you were so excited because you were so bad. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> that He would choose somebody like you. you. You're absolutely correct. And I know where I am. That's it. I know who I am. I know what's going on with me and Him. See. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. That he would have chose somebody like me. You're absolutely correct. And I want to give him what he got coming. I do, I do, I do. Lord be magnified. Praise God. chose me, but he chose me. Yeah. He saw me when I was even in my, in, in, in my own blood. He saw me, oh. and he he chose oh. me. Hallelujah. Oh. So I just stood to praise him because yes. this was so good to me, and I have sat down on him for a while. But now, okay, that, that message stirred me up, and I don't want to sit on him. I want to give him all the glory and the honor that's due to his name. Yeah. When he said move, I want to move. Well, and when while God is dealing, dealing with me, he put it in me to pray, like the brother Adam was saying. He put it in me to read my Bible when I read it. He does all of these good things. 
And I just enjoy, I'm here to enjoy all of his goodness and all of his mercy unto me. And I just stood to praise him because I tell you, I just feel something that I haven't been feeling. And I, I've been like that woman, have you seen him? Because I'm, I'm just spoiled. I, I was used to feeling that. I, I, I was used to hearing that. And I tell you, this is a great God. But for, for him to keep it and giving me that desire to want to serve him and to keep on running after him, I just stood to praise him for that. He gave me that to run after him. When I see myself falling short, oh, Lord, I'm here. I'm just short right there. Okay, but then I've been trying to get back up. But it's him that stirs me up and just give me that desire to run after him. And I just do praise. I love preaching like that. I love it. I love it. I love it because it takes it all away from me. It's not about me. God told me the other week. It ain't about me. It's all about him. So I just stood to praise him because he's a mighty God. And yeah. I serve yeah. such a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Yeah. I was just talking to him, Brother Adam, about some of these things, about that wolf and that weird. I was just talking to him about that early this morning. They that seek me early. He be just stirring me up and just, I'm telling you how, what to do. Get up early and seek me. Come to a noonday prayer. God is doing that. If it ain't noonday prayer, whatever time uh, with my job that I can find myself to get here. If it's not but for just a few minutes. Those few minutes seem like an hour sometimes. But I thank and praise God. I just want to give him glory and honor. I thank him for messes like this. It does take it away from me. God gets all the glory. All the honor. It all belongs to him. He's the one that's saving He's saving me. He's keeping me from all sin and shame. So I just do it to give him glory and honor that do to his blessing. Praise God. Uh, that what Brother Adams was talking about, about um, wanting to come to God or whatever, and it takes God to draw you. And I remember God put me through that when I was a teenager. I was uh, going from one church to another looking for God. I wanted, there, God had put something in me that wanted him, but he also hid behind the lattice. He wouldn't let me find him for a while so that I could cry out, so that I could realize that I wanted something that I couldn't give to myself. And over and over through the years, I had seen that anything that I want from God, I can't just go to God and say, I want this. Or, you know, he, like you said, he's not a spoiler. He don't just spoil us and give us every little thing. But he's, he has let me know over and over my position, anything I have, it's not because I wanted it. It ain't because I decided to keep it. It's because God put it in me. There was a time when I felt like God was telling me to give it away and I gave it to the person, gave it to the person, let it go. I got up at four o'clock the next morning and getting ready to go to church or, you know, doing my prayer my devotion and the Lord I saw an angel uh was that the no that was a MS but the Lord said that's what it was I saw the vision of Abraham over Isaac about to stab Isaac on the altar and the Lord said stay thine hand and he said to me stay thine hand over this piano I saw it and he said don't do that and I said oh Lord it's all right I didn't gave it to him I'm good you know it's okay and the Lord said I ain't telling you this for you you ain't doing this because, you know, it was good for you or it was something you wanted to do. It's what I want to do in the church. Hallelujah. It's all about him, Sister Warwick. It's not about me. It's about what he wants to do. And so I've learned that over the years that it's what God wants to do. And it's about what God wants to draw. And when he wants to initiate something, there's a lot of people out there that want to be called, Brother Adams. There's people out there running hard. They want to be a preacher. They want to have a church. They've done everything they know to do and God ain't backing it and they can't figure out why. But God wants to be the one to initiate. And until he initiates, all we can do is just sit and wait on him. That's all we can do is hope in him. Ask, seek, knock, and just sit and say, Lord, I, you know, Sister Dee Dee reminded me one time about how uh, when we were in elementary school, the teacher would say, who wants to help me do this? And a lot of us, uh, like me, that would always, me, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me, you know. And she was always, don't pick me, don't. <laughs> you know, but I was always pick me, pick me. You know, that's how I am with God. I'm like that. I'm like, pick me, Lord, pick me, Lord. But you know, until He picks me, I gotta sit in my seat and shut up and wait on Him to do it, Sister Margaret. Because if I step out there, I can do it. I'll do it, Lord. Then He'll say, Debbie, sit back down. I didn't call you yet. So I have to wait on Him. He has to initiate it, He has to do it. But the 
good thing about it is when God initiates it, he does it. Does he not do it? And he does it right. Oh, my Lord, I've seen too that no matter, you can get up and testify and you can have it all laid out. But if God ain't in it, it's dull and dry and everybody's looking at you like, sit back now. But if God gets up, you don't even have to say nothing but, whoo. And you know God is going to put something behind that to where everybody's just going to feel that woo. I just appreciate God. Oh, he's real. He is so real. I just thank God. Today. One minute or less. Psalm 65. Oh, yeah, bless the command of God. Oh, I'm sick of that. That's right, amen. Verse 4. Verse 4. <laughs> <laughs> you were, man. I tell you what, I appreciate it. I'm glad he chose me. He didn't have to do it, but he did. I'm glad he did. And it was right on time. Not too soon, maybe. I'm ready. Fourth verse, Psalm 65 said, Blessed is the man whom thou chooseth. It's God's choosing. God chose us and causes to approach unto thee. It's God's cause. God caused us. Jesus said, uh, no man can come unto me except my spirit of my father draw him. So as God caused us to approach unto him, I'm thankful for that, that he may dwell in thy courts. And we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house. And of thy holy temple. I thank God for choosing me. Yes. And causing me. I seen him do it. He caused me to approach him. I watched it happen. I didn't know where I was going, but he knew where he was bringing me to. And I'm thankful to be here. I probably thought it'd be more than a minute or two, too, Brother James. I'm thankful this message stirred me because last night I got stirred, Brother Adams, when you was talking about you sang that song and my father always sang, but today you stirred me with this here, and I can't help it. I keep seeing uh, you when you used to talk about a, uh, a, a human and the, when they have a dog, that dog worships them. Right. That dog, when they come home, they've been gone working all day. When you come through that door, that dog is wagging its tail. It's wanting to jump up on you. And unless you're one of those that don't allow them to, they're going to be all over you. And I think that's what he's wanting for us to appreciate him yeah, and love him with that kind of emotion. I come from a dog-loving family. Uh, I didn't realize how many people in my family love dogs. But right out here is one that loves dogs every bit as much as I did. I had dogs my whole life until... Actually, until God took them out of my life. <laughs> Most of y'all remember part of that, but I started abusing the dog that I had then. And well, but I loved my dogs, and I always had shepherds. I always had my dad had me with a shepherd. I was three years old when my mama wanted to find me out in the yard, wherever she called Kingle. Kingle, and Kingle would take me up to the house with his arm, with his mouth around my wrist. And bring me home or bring me to the door and uh so that's the way we're to worship him that's the way we're to worship he they say dogs are man's best friend you know a lot of people have a problem with that but I, if, I don't know that they're every man's best friend but if you got a dog and you treat him right you ain't gonna find nobody more loyal to you than that dog nobody that's the way he wants us to be to him and I'm thankful. I'm, uh, another thought I saw was when uh, I was thinking about your life, Brother Adams, how God put you through. You know, he called you. And when he approached you, he approached you when you was in the worst time of your life. But, yeah. And you and and when you, I was thinking about it, if you go to a dog pound, what's that dog in? That dog's in a prison. That dog is in a prison. And if you go and take that dog out of that prison, you know what? That dog's going to love you unless he's been abused. And even then, he'll learn to love you. Some of us have to go through abuse. Some of us have to go through things. This world will beat you up. And sometimes you won't even think about God until 
God knocks you to your knees and says, like Brother Hardy said, I saw that sign. I've tried everything else. Have you tried Jesus? And that's the way God will do with us sometimes. And then some of us will be here. I'd appreciate where we're at. Amen.
I just want to check it out a minute. Just tell him how grateful I am, you know. Gives you a different perspective. To know that he chose you, you don't have anything to do with it. Nothing. It makes you want to improve. It makes me want to improve. I see where I slack. I want to do better. I just, I just wanted to thank the Lord for choosing me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The Lord, the Lord has been good to us. Amen. Amen. The Lord is merciful. Thank you. The Lord is faithful. I'm glad that the Lord has given me the privilege to see one more year. And the last time I was here was in December of last year. And as you know, a lot of things have happened. Many that were on this earth this time last year, many are no longer here. But for reasons best known to God, we are still here. And we are thankful. I appreciate the Lord so much. I appreciate the fact that uh, the Lord uh, brought me here safely today. To see God's people in Benton Harbor, Michigan. To God be the glory. I appreciate Brother Adams and his wife. And this wonderful man of God holding our Brother Adams' hands. And the saints of God who are wonderful too. Bless God. I'm happy to be here. I thank the Lord for the spirit that I feel here. And for those who do not know me, my first name is Ade, A-D-E, Ade. And the last name is Ade Doja, Ade Doja. Ade means crown, African name means crown. Ade Doja means the crown became something of value. So Ade, Ade Doja. That's the name my parents named me. Praise God. Hallelujah. I appreciate the way we started the service today. Those wonderful songs. You know, war, words have a spirit. Words have a spirit. And even the songs that we sing, the lyrics, carry a spirit too. Now you can be having a good day, and then someone says something, and then you kind of get deflated. And sometimes you may be having a bad day, and someone says some words, and then your mood gets lifted. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So I really appreciate the, what we, the way we started the service. Raising our hands to the Lord, overwhelmed with gratitude. Yeah. Oh. I hope we are indeed overwhelmed with gratitude today. Oh, God. Abundant gratitude. Yes. Abundant. Not just trickling but abundant gratitude for the fact that the Lord has given you and I a chance to live a life of praise to him. I was really enjoying what Brother Adams was sharing because some of the things I had in my heart, he's already shared them. Amen. As I was coming, I was thinking, Lord, what would you have me share if you give me the opportunity? I was thinking about a few things which he has already said. So I know I'm at the right place. Yeah. Amen. At the right place. <laughs> no, there are certain words in the English language that uh, as members of the body of Christ, we need to really treasure. <coughs> One of them is that word grace. Grace. Because yeah. everything we, everything we need, everything we hope to become, will happen by his grace. By his grace. The grace of the almighty God. He is the God of all grace. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is full of grace, full of truth, and full of grace. Even the Spirit of God is the Spirit of grace. 
spirit of grace. So grace is a key word that we need to learn to appreciate. The other word is gratitude. Gratitude, they both start with G. Gratitude. It's hard for God to use us if we lack a heart of gratitude. Now, even the word says, in all circumstances, in everything, give thanks. Because that is the will of God. So grace and gratitude. And you and I, if we're in the body of Christ today, we were arrested by his grace. We were apprehended by his grace. That's right. And I hope that we're still being amazed by that grace. Because if we are not still being amazed by that grace, we need God's help. We need God's help. We have been apprehended by his grace. We have been arrested by his grace. I want us to go to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Just a, a portion of a verse there. Just to kind of uh, add some to what has already been shared. The Gospel of John chapter 15 verse 16. Just the first portion. And this is the Lord speaking to his disciples. Ye have not chosen me. But I have chosen you. Ye have not chosen me. But I have chosen you. And ordained you. That ye should go. And bring forth Fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may yeah. give it to you <clears throat> but my focus is on that first portion ye have not chosen me but I have chosen you. That's, right. that's a manifestation of his grace right that's a manifestation of his grace. Now we did not choose him, but he chose us. Thank God. And the interesting thing is this. In the Bible, it never tells us why God chose us. It just says he chose us. And if you go back to the Old Testament, you see the same principle. God never told the Jews why he chose them. It just says he chose them. <coughs> and that has an application in the way we deal with one another. Because when we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, there should never be a reason other than the fact that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the moment you come up with a reason as to why you love someone, it's just a matter of time. If they let you down, you will withdraw your love. So the scriptures never tell us why God loves us. It just says, for God so loved the world. Why? It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us. So this grace started to work in you and I when he chose us. When he chose us. Based on his love for humanity. So God selected us. He touched us. He laid his hand upon us. As uh, we see in the body, he reached down into the world of dead men and quickened our spirit, resurrected our spirit, touched our spirit, started to trigger some events so that we could come to him. Because some of us might say, oh, I repented. I did this, I did that, which is true. But that was a byproduct <laughs> of his grace, yeah. of the process he started in you. That's right. Which is often invisible, yes. but he was working in you. There's this passage in the, in the book of Acts, I think Acts chapter 18, I believe. It's about Paul on one of his missionary journeys. Paul visited this town or this city in Corinth. And Paul was fearful of uh, what was going on, persecution and threats to his life. Let's see, verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night 
by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. The principle is this. Even before Paul introduced the message to these people, God knew they were his. Paul did not know that. But God knew that they were his. So even before they came to faith, God had chosen them in eternity. Called them in time. Very key principle. Application. When you're dealing with people who are not in the body, do not assume that they are completely lost. Because they may be God's property. If in time, they will manifest as God's property. So here, God appeared to Paul in the vision and said, do not fear. Do not worry. i got people in this city. And eventually, he shared the message and people came to faith. This church. In Corinth. So the point I'm trying to make is this. We did not choose God. He chose us. He chose us. And he has ordained you and I to go and bear fruit. Which is a reasonable service. As what Adams was saying. That's a proper response to that calling. Is to choose to not bear fruit. To live accordingly so that he can get the glory. So that God can get the glory. Because it's his kingdom. He has put us in his kingdom by his power. And because of that, we ought to give him the glory. By the way we live, in everything we do, in everything we say, we ought to give him the glory. Because he is a mighty God. He is a merciful God. Merciful God. He has called you and I once again, given us a chance, an opportunity to live a life of praise to him. Because saints, we have to remember that eternal salvation, I'm not talking about temporary salvation, eternal salvation originated in the heart of God, not man. Eternal salvation. As Sister Devin was just saying, he initiated it. He instigated it. And if we keep our eyes fixed on him, he would take us to the finish line. He enrolled us in this race. And if we keep our eyes on the Lord, we will make it to the finish line. Because there is grace for this race. We've got about grace. There is grace for this race. And if we are continually overwhelmed with gratitude, we will make it to the finish line. That is a good God. It's not his desire for anyone to perish. But for everyone to come to repentance, which means making some adjustments. Making some adjustments. Someone said that if you're casual about your salvation, you will become a casualty. Yeah, that's right. If you're casual about your salvation, you will become a casualty. That's right. That's why the Bible uses that word, be sober, which means be serious. Have proper priorities. Do not just go with the flow. Because going with the flow is very dangerous. I was trying to say, make this point that life can be so short physical life. The brevity of physical life. Remember the Bible says that upon it unto man wants to die and after that comes the judgment. That's right. Life can be so short. The brevity of life and the reality of physical death. The reality of physical death is just a matter of time. We will depart from this earth as we know it. Right. The death rate is 100%. 100%. And if we keep living, it will happen. I know sometimes we think we'll be here till we're 80, 90, 70. Maybe, maybe not. It's in the Lord's hands. And 
there are four ways to die. I heard someone use the, these D's that I've kind of fallen in love with. He said, every one of us will leave this earth through one of these four D's. One of them is disease. Disease. You don't have to be pessimistic, but at the same time, it's something that we need to entertain in our minds that maybe this is going to be the Lord's will to lead by way of disease. The second D is disaster. And we know that uh, bad things happen to God's people. Disaster, plane wreck, car accident, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, bombs go off or someone gets shot. These are things that we have to grapple with. Disaster, disease. The, other, the third D is by design. Now that you do something foolish, the weather is bad, ice, get on the interstate, you 80 miles per hour. That's by design. Or start consuming alcohol day in, day out. Or cigarette smoking. There's no stuff that you can do to shorten your lifespan. That's design. Or going on top of a building and thinking you can defy gravity and kind of jump. That's by design by design, or God is prompting you to do certain things and you choose not to, then they choose to pull the plug. That's by design. So we have by disease, by disaster, by design, and then fourth, be by decree. In other words, you're doing everything you know how, and God says, it's your time. Amen. Went to the doctor, clean bill of health, and then a week after, the person is gone. Because your time is up. Your time is up. So death will come to every one of us. The reality of physical death. Thirdly, the certainty of God's judgment. We will appear before God's uh, judgment seat. We will all appear. And we need to think about that as we're living. Because if you, if you go to school, you go to college... If you never think of taking a test or an exam, you never study hard. But if you know there is a test coming and you truly want to pass, you will study. You will have some proper priorities. You, won't, uh, you will redeem the time because you recognize that this is very, very important. The certainty of God's judgment. And this judgment is going to be final. This judgment is going to be fair. And this judgment is going to be full. A full judgment. A fair judgment. A final judgment. And there will be no loopholes. In our attorneys these days look for loopholes. With God, there will be no loopholes. And there, there won't be no dream team. When we stand before the Lord. Everything is going to be right before him. The books will be open. And I say all that to remind us of the opportunities of the moments we now have. Right. Yes, we have the brevity of life, physical life. We have the reality of physical death, the certainty of God's judgment. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is the opportunities we have now mm -hmm. to live for God, live for God. to serve God, serve God in the beauty of holiness. holiness. Amen. The opportunities we now have. Let's redeem the time. Let's not take life for granted. Amen. Let's make our calling and election sure. Amen. Not to God, but to us. Because God knows if we're in or not. That's right. God knows. God knows if we're fooling around or if we're truly in. Right. He knows. Because God sees the heart. I mean, we human beings, we see the physical appearance, but God looks into the heart. God looks into the heart. So I'm trusting that the Lord will help us to examine ourselves, to see if we are truly in the faith, in the faith, to see if we are truly living this life by His grace and by His power.
No, there was a verse that uh, I heard uh, Brother Adams mention, and I believe some others referenced that same verse in Philippians, where the Bible says, work out your own salvation, not your neighbor's, but your own. Not your neighbor's, your own salvation, with fear and trembling. And then it goes on to say, for it is God who worketh in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's right. It's possible to hinder that work. It's possible to interrupt that process ah. if we're not careful. It is God who worketh in us both to will and to do. He gives us those desires and He gives us the ability to fulfill them. He gives you that passion to serve God and He gives you the power to make it happen. He gives you that feeling. Yes, this is the right thing to do. He's done so much for me. I have to live for him. And then he gives you the fire. Give you the fire. In other words, it's not going to happen without you. That's right. And it's not going to happen without God. Right. It's a partnership. Come on. It's a relationship. Right. Relationship. Relationship. And that's the big difference between religion and a relationship. That's right. In religion, you have good words. Good words, good words. But when it comes to a relationship, you have good words with good works. Good words with good words. So in other words, it's not just talk. There's action. There's action following the words. But in religion, religion produces good words. <clears throat> Whereas a vibrant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ produces good words with good works. That's right. And like we heard earlier, we're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. Right. Right. We're saved unto good, good works. Good work. right. So the proof that you're in the body is your good works. Right. Ah. So without good works, you're not truly in the body. Mm -hmm. Good works prove that you are in the body. Ah. Like they say in Missouri, the show me state. If you're saying you're in the body, show me show. by your deed that you're truly in the body. That's right. The means of salvation is always the blood of Jesus Christ. By grace, by faith. But the measure of your salvation, good works, good works, good works, good works. Now when we stand before God, we're not going to be judged by faith. God is not going to judge us based on, oh, he could have done that, she could have done that. God's judgment is based on works. Not, not by faith, based on works. Based on works. So like Peter said, we need to examine ourselves. We need to make our calling and election sure. That's right. God has chosen us. And the proof that he has chosen you and I is how we respond to this calling. Amen. How we respond to this selection. Right. How we respond to the touch of the Spirit of God. How can we prove to God that our soul indeed has been resurrected? Amen. How can you prove to God that your life indeed has been renovated? How can you prove to the world that you have been revived? the Lord Jesus put it this way, that we are salt and we are light. Okay. In other words, is your light shining? Are you shaking the salt? The salt. Shaking the salt. Shaking the salt. Not a salt. Not the salt. Are you shaking and shining? Are you shaking and shining? Salt, light. Why are you shaking and faking? <laughs> shaking and faking. Or shaking and shining. Big difference. May the Lord help us. To shake and shine. But not shake and fake. That's right. But shake and shine. Salt of the earth. Light of the world. And that will happen if we tap into this grace. The grace of the Almighty God. Because his grace will remind us that God is supreme. 
that God is supreme over and above everything, everyone, every spirit, visible and invisible. He is supreme. Not only that, he is sovereign. He is in control. He is in control. And he is sufficient for whatever need you have. That's right. Spiritual, he is sufficient. Because when we speak about having a heart of gratitude, if you do not recognize that God is sufficient, that God is sovereign, and that God is supreme, you will struggle in that area. Because you start to look at stuff. If God is supreme, how come this is going on? How come I lost my daughter? How come I lost my spouse? How come I got fired on the job? How come I believed God for this kid and then not serving God or even died? These are, I'm talking about real life situations. But even if you're in the body of Christ, these things may happen. And they have happened. So if you have questions about God's sovereignty, you won't have a heart of gratitude. Your love for God will start to grow cold. Because of stuff, situation. And you know, tapes often play in our minds. Tape, oh, questions, doubts, and all that. But when we have these issues settled in our minds, it becomes a lot easier to be thankful, to be overwhelmed with gratitude because He chose us. As what Adam said earlier, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. That's why the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, which means he owns us. He's our controller. He's our master. He calls the shots. He calls the shots. And all we have to do is say yes to your will. Yes to your will. I know it's a struggle, but that's where we ought to be. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Amen. Just like Job, who lost everything. Uh-huh. Lost his property, lost his finances, lost his health, lost his kids. Yeah. But he still continued to worship God. Worship God. Why? Because God selected him. Mm-hmm. Because God chose him. That's right. Because he was truly apprehended by God's grace. Because right. when you get apprehended by God's grace, come rain, come shine. Mm-hmm. You will follow Christ yeah. all the way. Amen. <laughs> Though none go with you, you still will follow. Because you have been arrested by his grace. By his grace. Because when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. That's a key principle. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. And that's one of the effects of God's grace upon your life. Because you may be seeing a period, but God sees a comma. You may be seeing a period, but God sees a comma. So you have to respect God's sovereignty. That he may not always do things the way you want him to. That's right. He may not always grant your request, but he's still a good God. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you deserve. You may think different, but he knows better because he made you. He made you. He made you. God is supreme. God is sovereign. And God is sufficient. The sufficiency of our God. He's given us everything we need for life and God. You have to believe that. If not, you'll struggle in your prayer life. Because you may have come to the end of your rope. Or you should never come to the end of your hope. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of your perfection. Christ in you is the hope of your growth. Christ in you is the hope of your victory. Christ in you is the hope of your deliverance. Is Christ in you? It's not something external. It's Christ in you. By the Spirit. By his spirit. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. The ability. The power. Christ in us. The hope of glory. 
And that's why the old song goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yeah. Look full in his wonderful place. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and in the light of his grace. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. That's true. Begin to change. Amen. May God help us to live a life of praise to him. A life of praise to him. I just want to give us four points real quick. In the first epistle of John, on how to tell that we are truly living a life of praise to him. The first epistle of John. Beginning in verse 5. First epistle of John, chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard from him, which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, in other words, if we say that we have a relationship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Light. Holiness. Godliness. Righteousness. Light. Wisdom, understanding, the proper understanding of God's word. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness in error, ignorance, immorality, unholiness, wickedness, iniquity, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, it's one thing for me to claim that I belong to Jesus. It's another thing for him to claim me. Amen? Right. And that's a big difference. The Lord knows those who are his. Amen? And as Pastor Annas was saying earlier, some are sent and some just went. May the Lord help us. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's you and God. Have something going on. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, you prove to God that you are living a life of praise to him by, in your life, observing and increasing sensitivity towards God's holiness and increase in sensitivity towards God's holiness which means sin bothers you when you do things that are wrong it bothers you when you do things that are contrary to the word of God it troubles you because you know it hurts your relationship with God because part of your calling is to live right God does not want you and I to walk in darkness. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, if you are truly walking with God, you're done with excuses. That, oh, I did this because that person did this. It's not about, when you get to the point where you say, Lord, have mercy on me. It's me, Lord, standing in the need of, in the need of prayer. Yeah. Not trying to justify, not trying to say, yeah, my dad was like this, so I'm like this, my mom was like this. Oh God. Amen. When we develop that increasing sensitivity to the holy nature of God, we will say, Lord, help me. Lord, set me free. Lord, loose me. Lord, destroy this yoke. Lord, remove this burden. That's how we know we're walking in the light. When we do something wrong, we ask for forgiveness. We don't say, oh, if I did something wrong, please forgive me. That's still the flesh. That's the flesh. That's pride. That's pride. If we walk in the light, I see he's in the light, which means we have a relationship with God. 
which means we are confessing our sins to God because we know God only traffics in the light. Mm -hmm. He doesn't traffic in darkness. Mm -hmm. So the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing us from all sin because we are confessing the sins to him. Yeah. It's not going to happen if you're not confessing. That's right. Because in 1 9, 1 John 1 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful yeah. and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all so it's an ongoing process. Yeah. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. So, in other words, if we state that we are praying, and all we're praying for is give me this, give me that, we're not asking for forgiveness, there's something wrong with our walk with God. But I'm sure nobody here is perfect. We all, we all have faults. We all come short. We may not be as bad as we used to be. We've made progress. But God wants that process to continue. Right. That process to continue. Even if it's a little light here and there, yes, you may not be smoking pot or uh, sleeping around. If it's light, if it's exaggerating, if it's uh, apathy, if it's prayerlessness, if it's uh, not uh, supporting the church financially and otherwise, confess to God. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse, will make a way, will turn things around. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Notice, if we look through God's lenses, through the word of God, we will see things that do not match this new nature. And we say, Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, cleanse me. But if we start comparing ourselves with ourselves and saying, oh yeah, I'm doing yeah. stuff, but I'm not as bad as Brother John or Sister uh, Lucy, <laughs> then we've not really gotten the message. Because it's not about your neighbor, it's about you and God. Yeah. You and God. Right. Am I living right? right? In other words, if I stand before God today, <laughs> is he going to say, well done? Or is he going to say, well, 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 well? <laughs> Don't help us. Don't help us. <laughs> an, increasing, an increasing sensitivity to the holy nature of God. In other words, we're asking the Lord to search our hearts. To examine us. And if there is anything that does not belong to the new nature, say, Lord, yeah. remove it. Yeah. Lord, remove it. Yeah. Whether it be a sin or a person that you're associating with that you know this is not godly, but the flesh kind of has a strong grip. You pray to God. God will break the tie, whether it be a soul tie or whatever kind of tie it is. God is still in the business of delivering folks. Yeah. That's it. Amen. God is still in the business of setting people free. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. But we have to ask him. Yes. We have to ask him. He knows if we are bound. He knows. But he wants us to acknowledge that we are bound and then come to him. So that he can deliver. So if we're going to live a life of praise to God, we must ask the Spirit of the Lord to help us to develop an increasing sensitivity to God's holy nature. In other words, you want to sin less. You want to sin less. Every day, sin less. You want to be a righteousness practitioner. Doing things that are right in the sight of God. Thought, word, and deed. Those are the four. I'm sorry? Oh. I thought you, you, you said you were going to call No. I thought that was it right there. You yeah. Thought, word, and deed. Be a righteousness practitioner. And increase the sensitivity to the holy nature of God. You know, out of the God of the Bible, in the, in the God of the Bible, there are so many attributes. I might have said this before. You know, the Bible tells us God is mighty. God is wonderful. God is a, a healer. He's a deliverer. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's faithful. All those wonderful attributes. Yes. But the key attribute of God that will change your life is his holiness. Mm -hmm. His holiness will change your life. Mm -hmm. His holiness will regulate how you deal with people or how you respond to people, even when they cross you. 
Because when you get to the point where you recognize that you are God's property and that he has your back, That's right. that will regulate how you respond to folks when they cross you, when they do wrong. Because you recognize that you're not by yourself. There's someone carrying you. As they say, you're standing on his shoulders. On his shoulders. In other words, when you truly believe this in your heart, because it's just in one's mind, you still say stuff and try to fight your own battles. But when you get to the point where you truly believe that you and God, you're one, walking with one another, then you begin to see his hand move in miraculous ways on your behalf, on your behalf. So the first point is having an increasing sensitivity to God's holy nature. Now Isaiah was a prophet and he thought he was doing good until he came into the presence of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. Then he discovered that, oh, whoa, woe is me. And that's what some of the challenges, challenges that we have. We are comparing ourselves with ourselves instead of the Almighty God. And yes, you may be doing better than your neighbor, but when it comes to God, you're still a million miles off. A million miles off. And Isaiah thought he was doing good till he saw God. Till he got into the presence of God. Then he said, oh, whoa, I'm a man of a million lips. And then he confessed. He confessed. And he got purged. He got delivered. <coughs> he got delivered. And that is why it's always advisable to keep short accounts with God. Short accounts with God. If you bring something to our attention, to confess it to him so that he can cleanse and deliver and set us free. Amen? Amen. The second point is this. It's in verse, verse 3. Verse, verses 3 and 4, chapter 2. And hereby we do know that we know him. Very key phrase. We know him, which means we have a relationship with him. We know him, which means we are connected to him. We know him, which means we have something going on. Verse 3, second, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we come to church. That's not what it says. Coming to church is important. If we tithe, that's important. If we're a member of the band, that's wonderful. Hereby we do know that we know him if we preach the gospel. All these are wonderful things. But when the dust settles, if we keep his commandments, if we keep his commandments. So how can we tell that uh, we're living a life of praise to God? Number one, an increasing sensitivity to God's holy nature. Number two, a growing desire to keep God's word. A growing desire to keep God's word. Obedience. 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 <coughs> Verse four. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. It's a powerful, powerful verses sure to help us. Because it's one thing, you know, it's kind of like maybe you're going to a, uh, an important show, going to a stadium, and someone give you a ticket, you kind of prepared, left home early and all that, go to the gate, you presented your ticket, and I said, no, this, this is a fake ticket. We don't want that kind of situation where you get to the gate and then you present yourself and say, no, you don't belong here. You don't have the right garments on. We don't want that situation. That's why John is trying to help us. Are we keeping God's word? Do we have that desire to keep God's word? That's why it's a growing desire. It's a growing desire. Not us, you're not in a rut. You're not stuck. You're growing in your desire to keep his word. And there are so many benefits to that. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Let's see here. Uh, 
the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. If a man love me, he will keep my words. In other words, if a man does not love him, he won't keep his words. He won't keep his words. But if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That means his presence in a tangible way. In a tangible way. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. There is peace. There is contentment. So if we are loving God by keeping his words, God has promised us his presence yeah. in a tangible way. And that is, you see his fingerprints. You see his fingerprints. And it's one thing to say, yeah, God loves me by, by faith. But there will be testimonies. Testimonies. Because you see him moving miraculously yeah. in your life. Not only in the church, but things that we call secular, on the job. You see his fingerprints that as God is arranging things, granting you favor. Yeah. Favor, favor. As you know, one day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. God's favor. Very, very important. His favor, his favor. A growing desire to keep his word. Verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. His word. A growing desire to keep his word. His word. His word. His word. And sometimes many of us were looking for more truth. Oh, give me more truth. And God is saying, Apply the truth that you already know. Don't look for more truth. These are the basic things that will keep us in the kingdom. Recognizing his holy nature. Having a growing desire to keep his word. Whether you know much about the book of Revelation or not, that won't keep you out of the kingdom. If you're clueless on the book of Revelation, but if you know that God is holy, if you're striving to keep his word, you'll make it in. You'll make it in. Thirdly, verse 9, chapter 2, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 9. He that saith, he is in the light, in other words, has a relationship with God, and hated his brother, is in darkness, even until now. That's another marker there. Verse he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Loving one another. Loving one another. Very, very important. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 13, if we lack love, we are zero in the eyes of God. We are zero in the eyes of God. Loving one another. Loving one another. A developing love for the brethren. A developing love for the brethren. Now, if you notice all these uh, qualities that uh, I'm mentioning today, it's in the present continuous tense. An increasing sensitivity to God's holy nature. A growing desire to keep God's word. Now, a developing love for the brethren. So there's a progression. There's a progression. A developing love for the brethren. Loving one another. Caring for one another. Sharing with one another. Willing to forgive one another. Because we have been forgiven. Loving one another. And the opposite of love is not always hatred, it's apathy. Apathy, which means you don't care. Apathy. Being indifferent. Because some, some of us may say, I don't hate nobody. But if you know your brother is in a need, has a need, or your sister, and you look the other way, 
That's been apathetic. Apathy. A P A T H Y. So when you talk about hatred, there is active hatred. If someone is trying to kill you or maim, maim you, that's active hatred. But passive hatred is like I just expressed. Someone has a need, you look the other way. Just like, you know, that man in the Bible who was going down to Jericho from Jerusalem, yeah. who was attacked by robbers, yeah. left for dead. Yeah. The priest came by. He was being indifferent. Oh, I got a schedule, gotta do this, gotta do that. The Levite came back, looked the other way too. And then a Samaritan came by and took care of the brother. Yeah. So the same principle. You don't have to be out there with a gun, a bomb, trying to kill people to hate folks. If you're just in your own world, not reaching out to nobody, not willing to make phone calls if you know someone is ill or go to a hospital, that's passive <coughs> hatred. Passive hatred. Okay, it's a body. It's not just about you, it's a body. And if someone hurts, we all hurt. God help us. A developing love for the brethren. A developing love for the brethren. When you start backbiting or bad mouthing, that's a form of passive hatred. They're trying to spread gossip or damage someone's reputation or hinder their influence. That's part of passive hatred. Passive hatred. God help us to live a life of praise to God. Yeah. Life of praise to God. And increase the sensitivity to God's holy nature. A growing desire to keep his words. A developing love for the brethren. A developing love for the brethren. And finally, 1 John chapter 2, verse let's see, 15. <coughs> Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world here refers to the world system. The world system. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And the will of God of this instance is to love not the world. To love not the world, the world system, the world's way of doing things. The unforgiveness, the hate, the bitterness, the malice, the anger, the hatred, the tit for tat, an eye for an eye. That's the world system. The world's media, the world's music, the world's way of dressing. In other words, the flesh. Anything that is fleshly. Manifestation of the flesh. Trying to seek attention. Pride, bragging, boasting. Being ungrateful. Having a, uh, a fierce spirit, always willing to fight, having a fighting spirit. Look at the ways of the world. Unforgiveness. Unthankful. Unholy. As uh, Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. Having a form of godliness. We don't want to have a form. We want the real thing. Not a form, but the real thing. Yes, sir. Real thing. Amen. So, what is the Lord trying to tell us this afternoon among so many other things? You did not choose God, but God chose you. And He has given you and I the opportunity to shake and to shine for Him. To shake and to shine for Him. Because He's the God of all grace, He brought you in by grace. He will sustain you by this grace. Yes. If we keep that heart of gratitude and if we reach out to him by faith, he will dispense his grace because he's a great grace dispenser. Great grace, great grace dispenser. There's grace for this race. 
There is grace for this race. So when it comes to developing an inclusion sensitivity to God's nature, there is grace for that. A growing desire to keep his word, there is grace for that. A developing love for the brethren, there is grace for that. That's right. A progressing hatred for the things of the world, there is grace for that too. There is grace for that too. Oh, yeah. But everything boils down to our prayer life. And I will close um, uh, here in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our, our profession. Let us hold fast our confession. In the Greek, that's what it said, prophetic confession. Verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, he can be touched and he can do something about it. Yeah. Now, if you come to me, I may be able to sympathize with you or show empathy, but I may not be able to fix it. But he's not like me. He will fix it. Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, he faced whatever test you can think of when it comes to living right, and he passed every test. So he has a testimony. Now, you know, in the world today, if you have some condition like breast cancer or alcoholism, there are support groups. And what, are, what is the purpose of these support groups? To help you. They've been through that. They've survived it. So you can survive it too. So those support groups are designed to encourage you. The Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to the issues that we deal with, he is the head of the support group. Yes, sir. And he will uphold us. Yes. He will preserve us. Yes. He will sustain us. Yes. But there's something we have to do. Verse 16. Because everything that is done, everything that he can do, won't happen unless we get to verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace. Because he sits upon the throne of grace. But we have to come boldly. We have to come with confidence. And you cannot come boldly if you're not uh, walking right before God. Or let me put it this way. If you have no desire to walk right. Because one thing to know that oh, I'm doing things that I, I'm not supposed to do. But Lord, I need help. But if you're at the point where you kind of settle. That I don't care. I'm going to be like this. Or whatever. Then there's a big problem. Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. We all need mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. Find grace to live right. Find grace to keep his word. Find grace to love my brother and my sister. Find grace to hate the things of the world. The grace is there. But if we are not coming, we, we won't receive because if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be opened. But we have to be passionate. We have to be passionate. So your prayer life is the key to a victorious Christian life. Because if you ain't praying, you're not going to live right. Right. You may be above folks in the world, but when it comes to God's standard, you're still living beneath your privileges. Stay living beneath your privileges. So because God has selected you and I, because God has called us, because he has touched us by his spirit, because of his grace, he now wants you and I to respond accordingly. Accordingly, accordingly. I know there used to be a song back then, uh, if the Lord really tells you what he wants, will your spirit say yes? It's one thing for your mind to say yes. But will your spirit really say yes? Will your spirit really say yes? And I'm praying today that God will bring us to that point where we say, Lord, you have been doing this for so long. Lord, turn me loose, set me free. 
instead of negotiating, say, Lord, let me do this for six more months. So when I turn 50, I'll quit. But saying, Lord, whatever it takes, remove it. Amen. So that I can truly serve you yeah. in spirit and in truth. Because yeah. like I said earlier, life can be so short. And for some of us, this may be the last few moments we have to make it right. I'm not predicting anything, but we just never know. We just never know. So whatever time we have left, let's live for Jesus. Let's shake and shine for him. Because the kingdom is his. And by his power, he has put us in the kingdom. And by his power, we'll make it to the finish line. And let's give him the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your patience. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I praise your name. For you helped me through so many things. I want to take the time to praise your name. He's my comforter. He's my friend. No great love. Oh